What's going on guys? This is Whiskey Wednesday episode 8. Eight. Welcome back. Today we're drinking Crown Royal again, which is pretty cool because it kind of lines up with, I know my cigar. You want to hit the cigars? Oh yeah, so we are both smoking a, we decided to switch it up. Each of us got a different cigar today. They're both medium body though, with a creamy smooth flavor. So I got the Gurkha Beauty. This is the Vegas Gold. And Vegas Gold. I like it so far and it pairs well with the Crown Royal. Absolutely. Um, so we want to give definitely a shout out to our sponsors, Mad Viking Beard Co. We have been using the heck out of their products. I will say it makes, you know, at work, we can't really show them off as much, but it makes the uh, smell a lot better inside that mask when you got beard oil sitting I, on that. I think I've been growing this since we started this, so I like the way it's going right now. Like, oh yeah getting there Oof. I need to fill in a little better but it does also make the beard a lot more manageable using their products as well as I'm trying to book to get my sleeve done John if you want to touch on their tattoo balm their tattoo balm I usually put it like because my lower half uh, sleeve shows a lot more in my work uniform I like to rub it down here it makes it look like brand new it pops um, so I use it every day when I'm going to work or when I'm going out with friends but yeah, I like the way it looks. It makes my favorite tattoo pop and stand out. It makes the tattoo look fresh. So I can't wait to get my sleeve started so I can start using that a little bit more. We both just booked consultation appointments with the same artist, actually. We're yep. excited. Um, so a few updates on our life. Uh, John just got done with something pretty cool, uh, a house call with some massages. So yeah. you want to go into that. So since the quarantine is dwindling down around here, a lot of businesses are opening up. I wanted to get a sports massage. Uh, I've been wanting to get one for a while. I used to get regular massages, um, deep tissue massages, but there's nothing like the sports massage that I just got over the weekend. Uh, we found a company that actually does house calls. So they came out to my uh, place um, and it's a sports massage. So it helps with a lot of range of motion issues, stuff like that. And he specializes in working on bodybuilders. So it helped out a lot. Um, my left leg has a lot of issues flexing, so I didn't have the lines that I would have in my right my right quad. He fixed that by um, when he was digging in, he had me like extend my leg and uh, flex my leg at the same time, um, back and forth while he was digging in. And afterwards, I flexed it and it looked 100% different than it did before. Also, I had um, a spots in my chest. A lot of people have this issue where it's like, it's jagged, the chest is jagged, the pec, fix that. Um, I didn't even notice that until afterwards. Like I was looking down and I was like, holy shit, what the fuck happened? Like he's, a, he's like, I'm good at my job. So <laughs> I'm gonna hit him up like once a month until my show. He said, when we get closer to the show, I should have um, more work done like three times in the last like five to six weeks. I'm um, just prepping, um, make sure I got range of motion because that's good for posing, like the flow of posing and all that. Um, making sure that I can show show off the work that I actually done a lot better. So why is that different from just like going in and getting normal massages? Normal massages I would say is like stress relief, um, more like just relaxing. The sports massage, this guy knows what he's doing. He knows like where to put, um, how to increase your range of motion. He gave me a bunch of stretches to do on my own um, before and after like, he wants me to work on my shoulders a lot. And then so a lot of a doorway stretches um, to help with the range of motion of my shoulders. So then that'll help with my workouts. It'll give me better like pumps and stuff like that. Um, more blood flow just by increasing, like helping that out. He said I have an issue with my left pec, which I noticed beforehand. Um, I've been noticing for months, I saw an imbalance, um, but he helped fix that a lot just by working on my shoulder and my pec over here. Hurt like a bitch, but it's gonna be good for me in the long run. But definitely a lot more effective. So like you said, your regular massages help with stress, help with stuff like that. Even deep tissue, they're not going into the level of detail that they will on a massage like that. Like Correct. moving you, moving you while like massaging you. So they're gonna like put resistance on your shoulder while pushing deep into the tissue. So for me, Oof. I know I'm putting you to work, probably ruining that entire massage experience. But putting you to work, moving in, um, yeah. Me and my girlfriend, we're gonna be moving June 1st and June 2nd. So John's gonna be one of the ones that we're abusing for that. <laughs> but <laughs> moving into a bigger place, 
so we have an office, we have a room, and we're able to, if something does shut back down, we're able to kind of give each other some space while we're working all the time. But my girlfriend works from home, so it's definitely going to be a lot more effective than that. But we're definitely upgrading on things. My life has definitely turned around since I moved down here, going from finding the cheapest place I could live to now being in a place that I love to live at. Yeah. So I'll be moving in about a month and a half, too. So you're definitely excited. upgrading, too. So oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so today topics that we're going to cover is why does your metabolism slow down when you're dieting, bullshit fitness products, um, when to use a weightlifting belt, and then also if you're wanting to move up in management, I think a lot of these things we're going to go over on this topic will be within kind of any career, but we're going to specifically cover kind of more the personal training side of things and where management is versus what personal trainers kind of duties are. So we'll dig right into it. Um, so why does your metabolism slow down when you are dieting? All right, your metabolism is going to increase because our bodies are pretty decrease. much just... Your metabolism decrease. is going to decrease. Oh, decrease. <laughs> Shit, prep rain already, I guess. When you're dieting. <laughs> It'll increase when you're in surplus. Okay, so our metabolisms are going to slow down. They're going to decrease because our bodies are designed to adapt. They want to adapt to whatever we're doing at the time. So if we're eating in a... Um, Calorie deficit. deficit. If we're eating in a calorie <laughs> deficit, our bodies are going to adapt to that and they're going to um, try to adjust the output to match the input. Absolutely. Um, your body's trying to survive. Your body's not trying to look sexy. So it's your job to make it look sexy. But your body's going to decrease the metabolism. The way it's specifically going to do that is by decreasing muscle. Your muscle is the organ in your body which burns the most calories metabolically. So the easiest way for your body to adapt to you decreasing your calories is lowering your muscle mass so what's an, what's probably the most effective macronutrient to help protein exactly didn't even have to know what i was going to ask um the most effective macronutrient to help limit how much muscle mass you decrease is protein that's why protein is so important protein often and the reason we say protein often a lot of times the eating every two to three hours thing kind of comes into play is simply to get you to your protein goal because the most important thing you can do is eat an adequate amount of protein. That all depends on your goals. So the most important thing you want to do is hit your protein goals. It doesn't matter if you're eating every two to three hours. It's very minimally um, for being able to maintain and build muscle. But your muscle mass is going to decrease. As we're in cuts right now, our muscle mass is going to decrease. Even though we're getting more cut, it's just going to show the muscle off more. Um, so that's what your body's going to do to help you adapt as efficiently as possible. So that if you're only fueling yourself with, say, 2,000 calories, it's going to do its best to only try and burn 2,000 calories. And then once you hit, hit that point where you're only burning 2,000 calories a day, you slowly dip that and give your body a little bit less fuel. You're going to cut fat the fastest, but your body will adapt by trying to cut out some muscle mass. And the key thing you said is decreasing your calories slowly. That's going to help you maintain as much lean body mass as possible. Instead of crash dieting, you're gonna lose a lot of a lot of lean body mass if you cut your calories by a huge amount. Absolutely. Your body's gonna drop that metabolism rapidly, and now you're gonna go up, go back into a reverse to get it back up before you go back down. All right, next up, bullshit products. What's your pet peeve? Bullshit products. Bullshit um, fitness products. One that I didn't think that I would see much when I moved down here is elevation masks. I've used them. I used them in the military. I bought into the hype that they would simulate elevation. They would help your lungs out. Um, I will hype them up in one area, but they don't simulate elevation. The only thing that's going to simulate elevation is elevation. Go train in Colorado. <laughs> Can't afford to do that. Don't buy a $70 elevation mask. That's about how much I spent on mine. Um, I've used mine for running three to five miles. I've done five to six mile ruck marches in my elevation mask. I will say the one thing is, harder. yeah, it makes it harder, uh, makes it a lot more miserable. Uh, the one thing that's really, really good at, I will say, is uh, your diaphragm is what help is the muscle that helps inflate your lungs and deflate your lungs. So it's going to help pull oxygen in. So if you're one of those people that finds himself heaving on runs and it's kind of like your oxygen intake and your chest feels really tired from running, I would honestly recommend getting an elevation mask because it's probably you just have a weak diaphragm. And if your body can pull oxygen into your body more efficiently, then you're probably going to get be able to run a lot farther. 
without actually improving necessarily your leg muscles is you need to improve that diaphragm so you're not heaving it using so much energy being put into that diaphragm uh, I know you got a few products that you're not too keen on as well sweet sweat and any other like wraps or spot reduction type deals so we hear it every day as trainers how do I lose this last bit of how do I lose this bit of fat on my stomach how do I lose the fat under my arms stuff like that you cannot spot reduce so regardless of what you do your body's only gonna lose fat the way it wants to lose fat so um, just a calorie deficit over time and eventually you're gonna lose that fat that you want to lose so wearing like a sweet sweat wrap making your stomach sweat a little bit more is not the move it's not gonna help you. these are all products that we're not just throwing shade at these are stuff that we've used we have bought into before and we've learned through personal experience what they actually do so. now sweet sweat is not the same as a waist trainer um, I see a lot of professional bodybuilders using waist trainers when they get closer to the show when um, uh, when they actually are at a lower body fat percentage using a waist trainer to actually like try to change their genetic appearance like a lot of people have thicker waist genetically and they need to use a waist trainer to pull it in a little bit more um, I've seen a lot of people use those a lot of people be successful using those and those are also like he's talking when he's a few weeks out from a competition oh, whether yeah. those waist like, trainers to help less than like six percent body fat for guys I see them wearing them. so even if you're still above um, 25% body fat, waist trainers are probably not the route not to effective. go, no. um, male or female. They're going to make it harder to breathe, they're going to probably mess up your organs and stuff like that. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend waist trainers or um, sweet sweats. Um, next one, more of a supplement, um, especially because I do, I am kind of sponsored by a supplement company too, so I think it's effective that I talk about this, but BCAAs. Um, really, the reason the company I'm part of came out with them is because people asked for them. People kept asking, and they got tired that people kept asking. The first thing that came out with BCAAs, and then what pretty much nixes the BCAA is they came out with EAAs later. I will say, for vegans and vegetarians, the protein that's in a plant-based product versus um, your meat and animal-based proteins they have different amino acid makeups. So that's where a BCAA could be effective, but an EAA is gonna be more effective. Those are your essential amino acids, those are the ones your body's not gonna get in um, unless you bring it in nutritionally. Um, so that's effective too, is you need a certain amount of leucine primarily to kickstart the protein synthesis. About 2.5 grams is what you need um, to kickstart the uh, protein sy synthesis. So you might hear that you need to eat 30 grams per sitting, um, 20 grams per sitting to get kind of into that anabolic state um, but it's the leucine that's in that if you're eating meat eggs those animal based products that's going to have that in there for you um, but your vegan vegetarian are not necessarily going to have that which is where an EAA could help boost it your BCAAs um, if you need flavoring for your water to help you drink the water BCAAs could be a great route to go um, you could also just get flavor packets that don't have a bunch of added sugar in there as well. Those could be a cheaper option, although there are cheap PCAs out there on the market. But if you're looking for that product that you're going to see that benefit out of, um, EAAs is the way to go. BCAAs, I would leave that up there on the shelf and invest into other things other than that. Um, the last thing, the last fitness product we want to call out. Um, I think there is some credibility to this product, uh, but fitness trackers. Smart watches. Smart watches. We all have them. Um, it's pretty well commonplace. You're wearing a normal watch. Uh, pretty much commonplace to see people with fitness watches on right yeah. now. So we're going to go about the pros and cons of this because this can go either way. Um, and we do think that there are a lot of benefits, but a lot of cons to it. Um, I wouldn't say cons. I would say misconceptions. Um, misconceptions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the step counting on it. That's probably one of the primary features. They, a misconception. There's some that can be more effective, um, but the step counting, I know my best steps ever was when I was in the military, driving trucks across country and you just get your arm propped up and it's just bounce along. I probably truly stepped about a thousand steps each day when I was in there, just we were driving for 12 hours at a time. My steps registered in about 25,000 steps a day. On the flip side to that though, for the yeah. step counting. On the flip side, 
it's a good way to assess where you're at with your daily movement. So if you if you're not like him driving all day, or even if you are, like if you're consistently hitting 25k driving, you're still gonna see fluctuations based on how much you move outside of that. But if you're not driving all day, if you're just active all day, um, let's say you have a step goal of 12,000. As long as you're hitting that goal consistently, you're gonna make sure that you're staying active that amount. What I would say is go outside, walk 100 steps and see how accurate it is. How accurate, a lot of watches are different. Like you said, one was, one of your watches was a lot higher than the other one. Absolutely. Um, go out and see how accurate it is. Walk, count the steps, see where it's at um, when you get there and then see how accurate your step count. For the majority of people that either work in an office, work in an active environment, if you average 8,000 steps a day and then your coach says, you know, let's average 12, you're gonna increase that up. So that average is actually an increase. So it's a it's very good to show when you're increasing your activity. Um, just understand if it says 12,000, your steps are probably not truly at 12,000. It could be moving around on, on the desk. But when your average is 12,000 versus 8,000, you got more activity. In it. Um, heart rate function on it. The heart rate parts of them three years ago weren't so accurate. I think they're a lot more accurate now. Um, especially measuring you know what your resting heart rate gets down to when you sleep there's a lot of stuff that we can go based off of with coaches if that's too high we can bump your cardio up you get us to an, a good average heart rate um, that we want to be at when we're resting like when we're asleep um, if that's already good to go we know we don't necessarily you know your cardiovascular health health is probably already in a good spot but those are pretty accurate on it um, the main feature for mine that I like versus having a regular watch is, I don't want to pull out my phone and time my clients. Right now I can't, we're not supposed to as trainers, be on our phones that carry a lot of germs, leave those up at the desk. But in ordinary sense, I want to just have my timer going so I can just hit play or start. It starts the timer for me. The watch starts vibrating when we're done. So now between sets, I can talk to my client for a minute, get info into their daily life, um, get info that I'm trying to get, con just connect with them more. Um, but I can talk to them, my watch starts vibrating. I, the, all my clients know that when I tap my watch, I, mean, I don't even have to tell them. Like They know the next set's about to start. They get to know that I'm gonna start saying, all right, next set. Um, so it's funny to see that when they learn that, but uh, that's my favorite function is just, I can't train clients without a smartwatch because I want that to hold me accountable so I'm not going five minute rest periods with my clients. Is there anything that you like about smartwatches specifically? I don't know, I don't have one. <laughs> John's probably one of the only people I know that doesn't have a smartwatch. <laughs> I should get one, but I don't have one. <laughs> I, I like regular watches. I don't know. I don't um, know what it is. I'm old fashioned. <laughs> so moving up in the gym, what are some tips that you should, A, everybody should use to kind of move up into in it, but we yeah. specifically go about moving up in the gym realm into management there. Into more personal training. Like We're not going to talk about sale, front desk and sales um, side of it, but personal training. First of all, you've got to be a good trainer. You gotta have the basics. You gotta be good at your job, good at training, um, because that's gonna help you teach other trainers to be good at training. Absolutely, you're gonna have to mentor them anyway. So if you can't get your clients to see results, you're not gonna get your trainers clients. to see, get their clients to see results, and that's what you need to be able to do. Um, some gyms offer free certs. I know at Crunch, um, they do free certs. They've Honestly, quite a bit of money that they've invested in this yeah, application for a professional build up. Absolutely. Um, but I want to also sit down with my clients and say, okay, or my trainers and say, why are your clients not seeing results? Or what are you struggling with? How can I overcome that? Because a lifestyle client isn't going to be as rigid as a bodybuilder. So you have to be able to come to a middle ground on how they can achieve their results too. Um, so that's one of the biggest things right there is your clients have to be able to see results. Um, one of the next things, you need to be able to lead and develop, and I think me and John can talk very well on that, having been in the military, is you need to be able to lead by example. So those minimal things, those basics as a trainer, you need to be able to do is generate leads. You have to be able to sell because as a leader, especially at a gym like Crunch, a successful gym, you need to be able to teach your trainers how to sell. And if you can't sell, how can you teach them how to sell? And if you can't motivate them to sell by leading, they're not going to sell and then you're not going to meet your goals and you're not going to get promoted absolutely or you're not going to stay in your job for long the basics so the manager has the overarching view they need to hit that sales goal for the club 
the trainer may or may, you need to get their buy-in so they want the club to get their sales goal too. But first and foremost, your trainer cares about their paycheck. So if their paycheck isn't where it needs to be, they're not gonna worry about the club sales goal, um, nor necessarily should they. But once their paycheck is where they are, you want that buy-in and that team effort so that they care about that sales goal too. When they can kind of play with the um, some of their clients and say, hey, can you, are you wanting to buy more sessions a little bit early? They can do that and you have that buy-in from them. But first and foremost, as a leader, you have to care about your trainer's paychecks and then they're gonna start caring about your sales goals for the club as well. Yeah, and uh, go, going off, piggybacking off that, once your trainers hit their um, paycheck goals or whatever, they might not want to sell unless you're also a good leader. Absolutely. So once they get to that point, they're going to think, oh, why do I need to sell anymore? If you're a good leader, if you're an effective leader leading from the front, they're going to see why they need to keep trying. So. Absolutely. And doing the biggest things is you work for your trainers as a leader. You need to set them up, whether it's handing them clients, uh, leading by example. Giving good leads. When you walk by, trash, pick it up. And they're going to be like, wow, my leader cares. Yeah. And I want to take care of them. And they're going to start to care about you more. A, when you set them up with good leads, you help show them how to book effectively because if you're just booking to book, that doesn't matter. You need to book to sell and to be able to gain that clientele. Um, so being able to do the basics, leading, showing them that you can develop them as a person, as a coach, as a trainer, um, and then you need to be able to show that the clients that you have can see results too, so then they look to you as a mentor. Okay. And the last topic we have today, I see a lot of people around the gym wearing lifting belts through their whole workout. When should you wear a lifting belt? Lifting belts are kind of the sexy thing to do, but you want to make sure you do it effectively. I don't usually touch my belt until I'm about 80% of my one rep max, whether it's in deadlifts or squats. Com heavy compound lifts, so deadlifts or squats is the only time I'll use it. Um, but I don't touch it. It doesn't leave my gym bag if it's not leg or back day. Absolutely, is I'm not touching it for that either. Anytime where it's a lot of pressure that could affect my spine, I just need that extra little bit of boost. But again, around that 80% mark before I'm throwing it on, um, depending on pain, if I'm going through injuries, things like that. Yeah. So we're not gonna want to have, or we're not gonna want to wear our lifting belt throughout the whole workout um, because it's not gonna help us increase our core strength. So during our workouts, working up to those heavy heavy reps, um, we're gonna wanna be able to brace our core. It's gonna help increase the core strength during those compound lifts and other, um, any pretty much any lift in the gym, you're gonna wanna brace your core. So that's gonna increase core strength. Wearing a lifting belt's not gonna, uh, it's gonna hinder that. It's gonna actually decrease your core strength. Absolutely, the biggest thing that I do is when I'm, even if my clients are curling, is I want them to brace their core and learn to do that. But when you're using that belt, the be most effective way to make it work is breathe in, flex those abs and everything pushes out, the belt holds it in, keeps that core nice and tight, but it's it's not gonna strengthen your abs, it's not gonna strengthen your core, it's gonna help brace your core. You need to be doing those ab exercises to keep that core strong. Okay, it's starting to rain a little bit, so let's wrap this up. Let's wrap it up. All right, so make sure you guys are following us on social media. John, you're gonna find him at official JD Fit, like John David. Me at Jake Block B L O C H, just like the name of this um, YouTube, Jake Block underscore fitness. We are both taking in person and online clients. So if you want that, reach out to us on social media. I have a link in my bio. You can shoot John a DM if you want him for your coach. Um, otherwise, come see us at Crunch Tampa Palms, as well as pay your dues. So if you got something from this, make sure you guys like this, subscribe so you get updates when we're coming out with more episodes and share it with at least one friend who could benefit from this too, whether they're asking about fitness or whether they're getting into fitness, getting deeper into fitness. If they could benefit from some of the information we're putting out, we ask that you share it with them and pay it forward. Oh, a little thing, um, we had a little change of scenery today. Usually we do this on my balcony, but it's by the pool and people were having a little party out there. Um, so we came to my Zen garden. It's actually pretty peaceful. We had a slight interruption earlier, um, but once they noticed we were filming, they were respectful. We have one more episode until episode 10 is going to be our first episode where we're kind of in an area where we shouldn't be interrupted. Place. My place will be switching to, um, so that'll be cool. And then you guys will get to see kind of the YouTube studio grow as we start to 
um, invest in more things to make this show more effective for you guys. Um, okay. So that's gonna be pretty cool. The last and final thing, we need a toast for Memorial Day. Today is Memorial Day. Um, we were filming this two days early yesterday. So the biggest thing as veterans that I kind of want to put out is this day, mm -hmm. I've gotten thank you in my DMs, I'm sure you have too. Today's not about us, that's Veterans Day. Memorial Day is for those who paid the ultimate sacrifice, that can't be with their families. So today, thank those families. Um, think about those soldiers who paid the ultimate sacrifice. It's about them. So, okay. cheers. See you guys next week. Later.